Would you take your Bibles this morning and open to the book of 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament? 2 Chronicles chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and uh, verse 1 is where I'm going to start to read. I'll read a few verses with you. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and verse number 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images, and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images that were on high above them. He cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their, their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And he... So he did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even on the Naphtali with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graved images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. And I want you to drop down to verse number 14 where it says, and when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. This is God's word. May we be attentive to it. You may be seated. Thank you so very much. Pray with me today. Heavenly Father, as we go to your word today, we recognize that the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, that in order for us to truly understand, we need to have the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, would you open our eyes today that we might behold wonderful things out of your word and open our hearts to receive it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever lost something that um, you didn't really realize you lost it and you didn't really miss it until maybe later you stumbled on it, maybe accidentally, and then when you found it, you realized you lost it (laughs) and how valuable it really was? The other day I was going through a junk drawer and I found a flash drive and I didn't really know what was on it. And when I put the flash drive into my laptop, what I realized is there were files in there of notes that I had taken as a seminary student, notes that uh, I hadn't seen for a long time. And I also found on that flash drive uh, pictures, family pictures um, that I had lost, uh, old pictures that were very valuable. And so there was an incredible joy in rediscovering all this valuable information. Here in this story that we just read in Second Chronicles 34, is a story of rediscovering something that was lost, some valuable information that was lost. And uh, this story begins by introducing to us one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, a king by the name of Josiah. So I want us to look at this story here this morning and notice, first of all, what I call Josiah's character. In verse number one, we we read that he was eight years old when he began to reign. And the Bible says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. It tells us in verse 2 that he walked in all the ways of David, his father. Um, In in the uh, kings, in the story, in the uh, Old Testament kings, they were always compared to David. He was the gold standard for kings. And so a king either walked in the way of David or he didn't. And if he walked in David's way, then he was a good king. If he didn't, he was a bad king. There's only a handful of kings that are 
mentioned in the Bible that walked in the way of David, and Josiah was one of them. And Josiah is unique here because he kept his heart tender before the Lord. It tells us in verse 27, he, he had, had a very tender heart before God, and God valued that. God um, blessed him because of that. You know, one problem that many Christians face is they let their hearts grow hard, and they don't keep their heart tender before God. Jo- Josiah didn't let that happen. And notice, notice what it says in verse 3, for, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. Now he's 16 years old, and he begins to seek after God more than he did the previous years. You know, normally when a child grows up and gets to be a teenager, their heart gets a little harder. But this doesn't happen to Josiah. He begins to seek God even more. And another thing that's unique about him is that he erased ungodly influences out of his life and out of the land. In verse number three, it tells us that he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places. The word purge here, the idea of to make clean, to make pure. Idolatry was defiling the land of Israel and Judah. What are high places? High places are basically, if you've ever been to Israel, it's a land of hills. These are hills where they would build these pagan altars and they would worship pagan gods. There were shrines that were normally there, normally a wooden pole that would go straight up, and they would have their idols that were there. And so dotted throughout the land of Judah and Israel at that time were these, uh, these high places. Now Solomon had built the temple. That was a place to worship. And yet despite that, the people of Israel were going to these idolatrous high places. You know, in the book of uh, First and Second Kings, a king is measured by what he does with the high places. And there's only two kings that are mentioned in the Bible that tore them down. And one of them was Josiah. Josiah was determined to remove all the ungodly influences from the land. And so the Bible says he purged the land of these things. In verse 4, it says he broke down the altars, and they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. Not only did he just break them down, as we read here, he would grind them into pieces. Uh, Why would he do that? Well, he was making sure they weren't going to rebuild those things. It's hard to rebuild something when it's dust. And he ground it down to powder. He ground it down to dust. And he took the bones of the priests that worshipped at these idolatrous shrines. And he he also uh, would grind them down to powder. And then, or he would sprinkle, excuse me, the the dust upon the bones of the priests of of, of the altars there. And the Bible says in verses 6 and 7 that he doesn't do this just in Jerusalem. He does it all throughout the land. And he doesn't do it halfway. These are not half measures. He is completely purging all the ungodly influences from the land. And as a result of this, what happens is there's revival that takes place. In fact, in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, there's a young teenager that's kind of influenced by all this. He's a young man by the name of Jeremiah. Ever hear that name, Jeremiah the prophet? Jeremiah was majorly influenced by Josiah and uh, was called to be a prophet. So what are you doing with the high places in your life? There may need to be some purging that needs to take place. But here's another thing about Josiah. He made a commitment to worship properly at God's house. Look in verse number 8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, so he's 26 years old now, 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land... And the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maasiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So what's he want to do now? He wants to begin to repair the temple and to renovate the temple. Why? Well, because the temple was in ruins. What does that say about the people? They were not worshiping God. They forgot about coming to God's house and worshiping. This regular practice of worshiping God, going to the temple, was set aside. So they were just steeped in worshiping false gods. And God's house was not a priority. And Josiah wanted to change all of this, so he commissions this renovation project Batches this three-man committee led by the scribe, and they collect all the monies, and they begin to 
do the work of rebuilding the house of the Lord. But then look at verse number 14. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, all that was committed to thy servants, they do it. So what happens when they were working on the temple? One man by the name of Hilkiah makes a striking discovery. He finds a copy of the book of the law. Now, what is this? It says it was the book that was given by Moses. So we know that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, right? So this is the law of God. This is the word of God that was written back then. And Hilkiah finds it. He gives it to the scribe. The scribe takes it. He, he brings it to the king. All this is brought to Josiah's attention. And, and what happens next is uh, he, he wants to read it. And I want you to, here's the second part. I want you to notice Josiah's contrition because look down at verse number 18. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. So here they find the word of God. Wow, good discovery. It was right there in the temple. They bring it to the scribe. He reads it to the king. And the reaction of the king is he tore his clothes. That was a, a, a sign of great mourning, of sorrow, of brokenness. Now, why would he have that kind of reaction? I mean, one would expect maybe Josiah to be happy. Hey, we found the word of God. We, this is something very valuable. Let me, let me tell you why he responded that way. I can just picture this scribe, and uh, he starts reading from the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible. And he starts in Genesis, and he reads about creation and the fall and Adam's, fall, uh, Adam's call and his family, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And then he begins reading in Exodus, and he reads about God's mighty acts, the Exodus. And then he gets into Leviticus about God's standards of holiness in the feast days. And then he goes to the book of Numbers, and he reads about the Jews in the wilderness and the rebellion that took place, and God punishing them for that. And then he comes to Deuteronomy. I think this is where Josiah begins to get broken, especially when he got to Deuteronomy 17. Why that particular passage? Do you know what a king was supposed to do when he first went to the throne in Israel? Do you understand what his first responsibility was? The first thing he was supposed to do when he sat on the throne Listen, I'll read it to you. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. Listen to what he was supposed to do. And it shall be that when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. You know what the king was supposed to do? He was supposed to make a handwritten copy of the law of God. He was supposed to write it out in hand form. Of course, there were no printing presses back then. So he was to take a copy and he was to write out his own copy of the word of God. How many know when you write things down, you have a tendency to remember it? He was to write it all out, uh, his copy of Genesis. In fact, I'm going to give you that as an assignment this week. I want you all to write out the first five books of the Bible, handwritten your own copy. You say, man, that's a task. That's what the king was supposed to do. He was supposed to write it out. And then it says in verse 19 of chapter 17, and it shall be with him. He's supposed to keep it with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. You write out your own copy and you keep it with you all the time and you read it and you refer to it constantly. I think that that's what all of our elected officials should have to do. This is what the kings of Israel were supposed to do. And obviously this was not happening. Because it, by the time Josiah got to the throne, they didn't even have the, the law of God. They found a copy of it in the temple. Which, what, what does that imply? 
It had been lost. I mean, this was a big discovery. This shouldn't have been a discovery. There should have been copies all over. Each king should have had his own copy. They should have been referring to it constantly. But the kings didn't do that. Not only did they not write out God's word and refer to it and read it and get it in their heart, but it was actually the kings of Judah and Israel that led the people into idolatry. They were the ones that started it. In fact, it started with Solomon, who uh, began to build high places to appease many of his foreign wives who wanted to worship their own gods. And the, and the seeds that Solomon had sown of the idolatry flourished under the rest of the kings. The kings were to blame for the apostasy and idolatry of the nation. And so the people began to worship other gods. They began to worship Baal, among others. And they were directly opposed to what God was saying in his word. And I think that uh, that was only the beginning of the sorrow that Josiah felt. He realized this wasn't happening. But it got even worse. In fact, I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. I want you to see this. Can you imagine Josiah hearing this read? In Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 15, just follow along with me here and just put yourself in Josiah's place when this is being read to him in Deuteronomy 28 verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, they all, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. You don't obey this, all these curses are going to come on you. Verse 16, cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shalt thou be in thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in. Cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and in all that thou settest thine heart or thy hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. And the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he hath consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest. The Lord shall smite thee with consumption and with a fever, and with inflammation, and with the extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of the land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down on thee until thou be destroyed. And that's just the beginning. There are 68 verses in this chapter. And they're all about cursing and punishment. Verse 25 is captivity and plague. Verse 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed in all the kingdoms of the earth. And verse 38, the land will not produce. Verse 47, Israel will be enslaved. Look at verse 47, because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and nakedness and in one of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. I mean, this is like wham, wham. This is just God bringing down punishment and curses, in verse 58, there's plagues for disobedience. And then in verse 63, Israel will be scattered. In verse 65, there'll be no ease and no rest. No wonder Josiah tore his clothes. No wonder he rent his garment after hearing all these things. And he's wondering, is, is this going to happen to us? And so what he does in verse... 20 of chapter 34, is he appoints a committee to go and investigate this. Are we going to, is this going to happen to us? In verse 21 of chapter 34, it says, go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in the book. Let's go look into this because we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. Is God going to do this? So he sends out some men to investigate this, and 
through the words of the prophetess Hoda. Sure enough, sure enough, the word does come back in verse 23. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the men that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. Josiah's worst fears are affirmed. All the threats, all the curses in the book will fall on Judah and Israel. The people had turned from God to burn incense to other gods. Wrath was coming. They just simply forgot God. They simply just turned away from God. They forgot his word. But here's the third thing about Josiah I want you to see. Josiah's covenant. Josiah has genuine brokenness, genuine sorrow. His brokenness is over the sin of his nation, his people. His brokenness is because I think he truly loved God, and he wanted to make a commitment to God's word. And you know, because of that, he was able to hold off God's judgment. Look down at verse 27 here. The, the prophet is still speaking. Again, in verse 25, it says, you know, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. But in verse 27, here's a message from God to Josiah. Because thine heart was tender and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou heardest his words against this place and against the inhabitants thereof and humblest thyself before me and didst rent thy clothes and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. And so God sees the tender heart of Josiah. And God says, you know what? I'm not going to bring this during your time. I'm going to hold off on this. In verse 28, behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. God says to Josiah, you know what, Josiah, because your heart was tender, because you love my word, because you fear me, you honor me, you know what? You're not going to see this. I'm going to prolong this judgment another generation and after you die, then I'm going to rain down the judgment. But I'm going to wait because of you. And so there's a sense in which Josiah was able to hold off the wrath and judgment of God because of his humble heart his repentant heart. But then I want you to see what Josiah does. In verse 29, he kind of calls a national assembly together. And, and basically, in verse 30, notice it says, And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests, and the Levites, and all the people, great and small, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of of the Lord. And the king stood in this place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. You know what he does? He, he himself makes a covenant. He says, you know what? He brings in a national assembly. He has the word of God read to them. And you know what he says? You know what? We're going to start to do this. We're getting back to the word of God. We're going to obey it. He makes a covenant in his heart to obey. No wonder he had such an impact. He determined to love God and to obey his word. You know what? We will do more for this country by preaching and teaching and living the word of God than anything else. We'll do more for our country in doing that. So God's word was rediscovered. It had been lost. You know, what's interesting to me is uh, the reason God's word was lost was not because it had been misplaced. I mean, it's not like it was in some secret place. It was right there in the temple, right where it should have been. It was lost because they had forgotten it. It was not lost because they could not find it. It was lost because they didn't want it. It was lost because they didn't think they needed it. And if that was true, then I submit to you that today God's word is just as lost as it was back then. It's still lost. 
It's lost because of neglect. Our country has lost it. Our country has lost it. I believe we're in the same danger here in America. This nation has forgotten God, and they have cast aside the word of God. Now, I know that America hasn't, didn't make a covenant with God the way Israel did at Mount Sinai. I understand that. So save the comments. I get it. I mean, I read the Old Testament. But I want to tell you, we were a nation founded on the word of God. Despite what revisionist historians wanted you to believe, this was a nation that was founded under God, on the word of God, and God honored us because of it. One of our presidents wrote in his address, America was born a Christian nation. This is one of our older presidents. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelation of Holy Scripture. I think I told you before that one of the acts of Congress was to buy Bibles to give every American back in the early days. 94% of all the writings of the founding fathers that are contained, quote, Holy Scripture. The state constitutions of all 50 states, quote, Holy Scripture, and mention God. There's an image of Moses carrying the tablets of God's law It faces the Speaker of the House in the House of Representatives. But you know what? America has cast aside the Bible just like Israel did. The USA Today polled Americans read the Bible every day. More than half read it or never at all. And I believe that we've just cast it aside as a nation. Think about I think I know I've told you this before, but at the first inauguration of the first president, George Washington, after he made the oath of office, he's the one who added the word, so help me God, and then he kissed the Bible. And then the first thing he did was he led a parade of the House of Representatives and the senators down the street from Federal Hall, the place of the inauguration, to a little church. He led them all down there, and our nation's first president and the House and the Senate were all inside a little stone church. And what they did, this was all put down in the annals of Congress. You can read it for yourself. But this was the first ever joint session of Congress with the, with the president. You know what they did? They read the scripture and they prayed. And this is what they said. We want to gather for prayer to commit the future into holy protection and blessing of the Most High God. That was April 30, 1789. The name of the church was St. Paul's Chapel. Remember, at that time, New York was the nation's capital. And so that was holy ground. That was the grounds upon which President Washington and the Joint Congress prayed to consecrate and dedicate dedicate this country to God. This, that became America's ground of dedication. Just like when Solomon dedicated the temple and prayed for blessing, even so this happened. By the way, what happened to Israel when, when they turned their back on God? That whole temple was, became a heap of bricks. It became a heap of ruins. By the way, that place, St. Paul's Church in New York, you know what that became? That was ground zero in 9-11. It became a heap of bricks. When that, those buildings came down, they came down right on that place right there. Call me crazy, but I, I don't think that's an accident. I see providence in that. You know what I think we need as a nation? We need a revival of turning back to the Word of God. We need to turn back to God's Word. Nations have lost it. Families have lost it. There was a time when there was a Bible on the coffee table in every living room. And there was a time when, when fathers would gather his family together and read the scripture to his family and talk about it. Family devotions. Moses said this to the children of Israel. He said, these words which I command thee shall be in your heart and you should teach them diligently to your children. And talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, you should be talking about it all the time. Churches have lost it. This is even worse. We're living in a day when the Word of God and the preaching of the Word is not central in churches anymore. People want other things. They want entertainment. 
you know, I'm supposed to amuse people when they come. Or we're supposed to amuse people. Entertainment has replaced edification and exhortation in the church. Walt Kaiser, the great scholar, said, it's no secret that Christ's church is not at all in good health in many places of the world. She has been languishing because she's been fed, as the current line has it, junk food. And simultaneously, he says, a worldwide spiritual famine resulting from the absence of any genuine publication of the Word of God continues to run wild and almost unabated in most quarters of the church. But Christians have lost it. The average believer today hardly picks up their Bible to read it. And I'll be honest with you, I don't understand that. I really don't understand that. If you're a true believer, you will have a natural hunger for the Word of God. What food is to the body, God's Word is to the soul. And just like you need daily nourishment for your body, you need daily nourishment for your soul. Job said this in Job 23, 12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So you know what? We just need to rediscover the word of God. Now, we're talking about spiritual disciplines. If you were here last week, remember I told you we're going to talk about spiritual disciplines. And the greatest spiritual discipline you need to develop as a believer is a relationship with the word of God where there's the constant intake of God's word. And so I just want to suggest to you five things we need to do with it. That was just the introduction to the sermon. I know some of you have a horrified look on your face right now. I know I've got about three minutes left. So I've got three minutes to make five points. So let me just give them to you real quickly. Number one, just read it. Read it. That's the first thing Josiah did was to read it. Paul said to Timothy, till I come, give attendance to reading. Timothy, make sure you're reading it. That's why we read God's word in worship. I know that's what scripture tells us to do, but also you need to read it yourself. 23%, almost one in four professing Christians say they never read the word of God. We're talking about disciplining ourselves to godliness. You can't be disciplined to godliness unless you're reading scripture regularly in your life. Jesus said this, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. Many times when Jesus spoke, remember him saying, have you not read, have you not read, have you not read? What was he assuming? That if you are a child of God, you're going to read, and you're going to read God's word. We need to read it. Number two, we need to hear it. Josiah called a national assembly and had the word of God read, and the people there, they heard, they listened. Paul said, till I come, give attendance to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. Again, this was public assembly. This is a spiritual discipline. You come together, you read God's word, and then you speak it. You exhort people with it, and then you give them doctrine. That's preaching and teaching. This is what should happen in the church. And we need to discipline ourselves on how we hear the word of God. You understand, beloved, that when you come to God's house and listen to the word of God, this is unlike anything you do anywhere else. There's, this is something sacred to God. And when you come, you need to be a disciplined hearer. The Bible says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's not enough to come to church and sit there passively to listen, but listen actively. Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, for this cause we thank God without ceasing because when ye receive the word of God, ye receive, you, heard, you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believes. And a big part of this is just desiring God's word, just a hunger for it. And let me give you the, the fourth thing, or th- th- Third thing, sorry. I'm really glad you're listening. (laughs) Number three, study it. Just study it. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Bible study is work. You have to discipline yourself to do that. And if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to really grow as a Christian. Christian. 
Paul commended the Bereans because they searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. When Paul would give them the word, they wouldn't just passively walk away. They would dig into it for himself and say, you know, you know what, he's right. They would make sure that what he was saying was true, that it was right. That required study. We need to get into a Bible study. That's why we have Sunday school classes. That's why we have Kingsville School of the Bible. We have all these other opportunities for people to get into. But you need to have a personal study of God's word in your own heart and in your own life. But here's the fourth thing. Meditate on it. Meditate on it. This is another thing that we see. By the way, there was a character here in this story that I mentioned. His name was Jeremiah. Here's an interesting twist to this story. Jeremiah's father was named Hilkiah. Hilkiah is the guy who found the scroll in the temple. Listen to this verse from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was in me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. What was Jeremiah's response to finding the word of God? Jeremiah said, thy words were found, and I did eat them. Now, obviously, that's not literal. He didn't pick up a scroll and start chewing on it. What it means is, is that he began to read and he began to spiritually digest the truth of Scripture. You know what this is? This is called meditation. Hearing God's Word, reading God's Word, studying God's Word, getting it into your heart, and then beginning to meditate on it. Because when you meditate on Scripture, you know what happens? You begin to live it out. It's almost automatic. You become the thing that you think about. That's how powerful the mind is. You begin to do the things that you think about, that you meditate on. That's why it says in Joshua 1a, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That is, don't stop talking about it. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? Why do we have to think about it all the time? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. The bridge between information and application is meditation. When you think about it, when you meditate on it, you begin to do it. It becomes part of who you are. It's spiritual digestion. That should be the thing that consumes your mind. And I know that we live in a day when your mind is being bombarded with so many things. There's so much competition out there to control your mind. But you need to have your mind under the control of the Word of God and the Spirit of God, so that you will live it out. And that's finally the last thing. You just, you apply it. You apply it. Josiah made a covenant to act on God's word. Now, I read this story when I was a young college student, and I want to tell you something. It had a huge impact on me. Huge. Even back then, I saw, you know what? This is what the world needs. The world needs the word of God. It needs the word of God. So, I have two sons. I named them Josiah and Jeremiah. Kind of tells you how this impacted me, right? You know what my prayer is? God, make me a Josiah. Make me a Josiah. Grant that I have that kind of commitment to your word, to live it out. And help me to have an impact with those around me. If we had a group of people that had the heart of Josiah, we would see revival in this country. We would. Let's bow for prayer together. And so, Father, we again are just so very thankful for the Word of God and for what you teach us. Because, Lord, it's through the Scripture that we learn of you. It's beyond just the sacred page. We, your word is sacred to us because it teaches us who you are. Like the songwriter said, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. Through the word of God, we learn the gospel. Through the word of God, we learn of Christ our Savior. Through the word of God, we learn about the, your greatness. We learn about your holiness. We learn about our own sinfulness. We learn about how we need to come to Christ our Savior as the only way of salvation. Your word is truth. Your word is life. And so, Lord, forgive us for taking it lightly, for 
walking away from it and not every day saturating our soul with the truth of Scripture. So, Lord, I pray that today you will give us the same commitment of heart that we see in the life of Josiah. Make us all Josiahs, people who love you, who fear you, who love your word, and who are committed to obeying it and living it out in our life because this is where true revival takes place. Lord, may that be true of every one of us. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, just let me say, friend, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, this is, that's your starting point. Your starting point is coming to Jesus to begin with, realizing that like all of us, you're a sinner and that you need a Savior and that you'll turn to Christ with all your heart, ask for his forgiveness, repent of your sin. And friend, if you do that, you know what? He'll save you. He'll save you. And if you're here today and you've never made that decision, I'm inviting you right now. Would you come to Christ? Would you open your heart and your life to Christ and say, Jesus, save me. Save me. Is that your prayer? Would you pray these words? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. And if that's your prayer, please let us know. We want to encourage you into the things of God. Father, again, thank you for your word. Bless this word to hearing hearts today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.